Hi and welcome to Sweden Innovation Days. And to our event called From This to New Normal, Good Life for All in Climate Neutral Cities. My name is Linda Andreen and I'm the Executive Director of Sweden US Green Transition Initiative. And we are backed by the Swedish Energy Agency, the Swedish Innovation Agency, Vinova, and the trade organization Business Sweden, together with the Embassy of Sweden to the United States. We have an office in DC and also a foothold here in California with one person here. And today we are standing outside Nasdaq. And together with me, I have Ole Dix from Viable Cities. So why are we here? So we are here because we've been pioneering how to work with mission-oriented approach for the transition to climate neutral cities by 2030 with a good life for all within the planetary boundaries. We've been focusing in Sweden uh, for now on 23 cities uh, with this mission. And we've also been pioneering how to work with this uh, in the European continent. So we have quite a lot of insights that we'd like to sort of share uh, for others to uh, use uh, in other cities around the world. So now we're here to find partners that we can team up with, strengthen our capacity to build on the global mission of climate neutral and smart cities. And of course, this is now in the country of the Apollo program. So over 50 years ago, uh, US put the man on the moon, as uh, so we also have quite a lot to learn. Uh, so we want to find the partners that strengthen this uh, um, sort of quite ambitious mission of being climate neutral with cities all over the world. Uh, and uh, now in the US, uh, we have this event uh, from Niche to New Normal, uh, where we really want to discuss how some niche developments such as energy communities and other things that you will hear more about in the event, how we can take this uh, to something that is actually the new normal. That sparks the conversation what it needs to sort of scale. So here uh, we will have an interesting conversation, for example, on the importance of investing where it matters. So, welcome in. Welcome. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to San Francisco. Woohoo! Woohoo! Woo <laughs> and welcome to NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, a place where innovation and creativity meets to shape the future. Uh, we're very grateful that, once again, NASDAQ is partnering up with uh, the Bifrost Summit. Today, we will learn about the journey towards a sustainable urban development. And I'm thrilled to announce Sustainable Cities brought to you by Nordic Innovation House. My name is Marcus Rongren Liu, and I represent Sweden US Green Transition Initiative. We work with uh, finding collaborations within sustainability. I'm based here in Silicon Valley, and I work together with my colleagues based out of Washington, DC. Uh, so why sustainable cities? Well, in 20 years, urban population in developing countries will double to 4 billion. Already today, 1 billion lives in urban slum. One and a half billion are living in repeated cycles of violence, and over 2 billion people are affected by natural disasters. So that is why our quest for sustainable cities and a good life for all is more crucial now than ever. Today, we will have an exceptional lineup of thought leaders, innovators, and change makers who will share their insights and visions for a sustainable urban future, fight against climate change, and enhancing quality of life. So, moving on to our first block. From niche to new normal, a good life for all in climate neutral cities. Here we will hear about uh, how we can reach climate neutral cities by environmental actions, livable, equitable, and resilient urban spaces. Uh, we dive into sustainability, uh, aiming to redefine city living for a greener future. So please help me welcome up on stage. Uh, Andreas Snetz, who is portfolio, Innovation Portfolio Manager at Vinova here in Silicon Valley, who will be summing up facts we know, such as the importance of good life, system innovations, and investment needed uh, to, change, uh, to make change happen. So, welcome, Andreas. Thank you. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this session of Bifrost and to San Francisco. 
So my name is Andreas Netz, and I work for Vinova, the Swedish innovation agency, and I'm also based here in Silicon Valley with my colleagues. Um, just to get a feel for the room, hands up, how many are from the Nordics? How many are from the US or live here in the US, all right? And how many live in cities or in the city? Uh, a lot of us live in cities, yeah. Um, super short about what we know about is before I get started. So we are the uh, Sweden's Innovation Agency. We are about 220 coworkers. We have a total uh, portfolio of about 2,400 active projects that we fund. And our yearly budget is about 330 million US dollars. And we fund research and innovation projects. And for us, innovation, of course, but also- I only, products. sorry, can you unmute? I cannot hear you. What? <laughs> Should I mute? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, global collaboration is crucial. Um, we work internationally. We have uh, offices around the world. We have one here in Silicon Valley. We are present in Brussels and in uh, Tel Aviv as well. Uh, we connect companies and organizations in Sweden with organizations in other countries and promote international collaboration in research and innovation. All right, today's topic, sustainability, climate neutral cities. For us at Venova, our vision is that to create good living conditions and attractive habitats for everyone within the planetary boundaries. That's how we envision sustainable societies. Today we're going to talk more about cities. Seeing as I'm not an expert on cities and being in San Francisco, you have to do something with AI. So I asked my dear friend, ChatGTP, what's a city? Um, a city is a bustling human habitat characterized by dense populations, diverse architecture, intricate transportation networks, educational and healthcare institutions, and interconnected systems that sustain daily life. It's a pretty good uh, short prompt, good answer. Uh, thanks, buddy. Um, and he added my favorite word as well, systems. If you work at Minova, we say the word system probably 50 times a day. Um, so cities are complex systems of energy, housing, transportation, and social activity. And according to the professor Ronald Heifetz, each system is perfectly aligned to produce the result it currently gets. So if today's cities are complex systems that are perfectly aligned to produce the current results, if that's the case, and the current system isn't performing the results that we want to see, <clears throat> how do we then change the system? System change is, of course, extremely difficult. Uh, it's not de about developing just one solution to fix a problem. <clears throat> it's about experimenting with many interventions to unleash wider change towards a common goal, according to the brilliant uh, Jori van den Steenhoven uh, from Mars uh, March Deep Lab. Um, so in other words, we need to test a lot of different interventions to get a system, to get a system effect. And when we find what actually works, we need to scale that. And why cities? Uh, Marcus gave us really good uh, statistics and insights about cities here earlier as well. Um, why do we need to transform cities? Well, they only cover about 3% of the world's uh, land use on Earth, but they produce up to 72% of all global greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And these complex systems of energy, housing, transportation, social activity needs to be transformed. We need to change each system and the entire system as well. Um, and so in terms of achieving climate neutral cities, there's quite a lot we have to do. And to transform the cities, it's not enough with just technological innovations. We need new uh, services, business models. We need new policies, regulations, as well as changing human behavior. We need to innovate how we innovate. And at Vinova, we usually talk about if you're going to do, uh, if you, you want to succeed with system change, we need to innovate with a system perspective. And we have defined these five um, perspectives, which are uh, based on the, the research for, uh, from Masakato. 
So not only focusing on the technology side, we also need to focus on the business models, the investments, making sure we allocate money to the right things. We need to look at the policy and regulations. Might be that the new solutions that we need to transform the current system isn't legal today. Uh, might not be able to actually implement at all. So we also need to work with policy innovation. We need to look at the behavioral and culture side of, of it as well. What do we need to change the way we do things today in order to get the change that we want to see? And we need to look at the infrastructure. Of course, talking about cities, it's the, it's the physical uh, built environment, but it's also the digital environment, the digital infrastructure, getting everything connected, working, open data, all this. So we need system innovation to transform our cities. And today we will now hear some examples from both the Sweden-US uh, Green Transition Initiative and the Strategic Innovation Program Viable Cities with examples from cities around the world who are working on doing this and trying to uh, achieve system change. So give it up for Linda Andrian from uh, the Green Transition Initiative that will take us forward with this. All right, thank you. Thank you, Andreas. And uh, Ulle will deal with some technical issues. And uh, I'm so excited to be here in California. Sweden signed an agreement with California around green transition two weeks ago. And California is leading the transition to climate neutral cities. So it's great to be here. And it's also great to have joined with viable cities because they're great in technology and, and technique, uh, but also around the system innovation. So together with Sweden US Green Transition Initiative, we pave the way for collaboration for Sweden and the Nordics to increase knowledge exchange on a global scale. You heard from Andreas already how much emission comes from cities. So I'm really happy around this project that we together can reduce emissions and work towards to create a good life for all. Is it ambitious? Yes, it is. It is pioneering the possible and uh, leading transition into climate neutral cities. Um, so I will give you uh, some examples around that. And I also think we have some of the cities in the audience. So I really hope I will get the details right. Otherwise, shout out and correct me. So in Oakland, the city is recognizing the substantial carbon footprint from built environment. And efforts are underway to innovate approaches to develop affordable housing and thriving communities for everyone. Simultaneously promoting sustainable, sustain environmental sustainability and economic prosperity. Thank you, Oakland, for paving the way to a more sustainable and inclusive future. At the same time, Bristol are facing climate emergency and housing crisis and aims to develop 24,000 new affordable homes by 2050. The built environment stands for 40% of the emissions in the UK. And Bristol wants to discover how we can develop and scale new ways to deliver affordable and carbon neutral houses by innovative business model, also stressed by Andreas. And this is to shape housing development appraisal and financial models. In Makinje Sabagabu, it's another example. It is a fast-growing city, and it faces sizable affordable housing shortage, and wants to test and develop sustainable solutions for climate-responsible, affordable housing neighborhoods. Several cities take the lead for sustainable mobility by planning climate-neutral zones. And these efforts include transition in regulation, policy, infrastructure, logistic, business models, and behaviors. And one of the cities is the city of San Jose. It's the 10th largest city in the US, and they have decided to become net zero by 2030. The two most significant contributors to the emissions are transport and buildings. And around transport, the city has decided to reduce both heavy transport, but also the number of fossil fuel vehicles. And the decision as such opens up for other opportunities, alternative transport, like pedestrians and cyclists. And the risk of traffic congestion is reduced at the same time. In Bogota, more than 67,000 transport trucks and vans clog the streets every day. 
and contributing not only to congestion but also uh, emissions. A lot of tons of carbon dioxide. And more of 70% of those vehicles belong to small fleet owners and many of them operate in informal conditions, leading to that 40% of the shipments are empty at any given time. So how can their efficiency and productivity be increased to reduce both congestion and emissions? Bogotá is pioneering innovative business models that contribute to improved freight mobility in the city, reducing both greenhouse gases and pollutants emissions from logistics. Stockholm has decided to be climate positive by 2030. The current transport accounts for 40% of the city's emissions, but the reduction is going too slow. So they want to demonstrate how mobility systems for people and transports of goods can be transformed and being high capacity, low emission and for better health. Stockholm is planning for a broader system change by implementing an environmental zone class three in the, in the city. And that sets higher demands on the type of vehicles in the zone. And the zone itself is an engine and a window of opportunity to transform beyond the city boundaries and the zones. In Lund, large number of actors are jointly want to achieve a large scale change process toward a global climate neutral Lund by 2030. Emissions from the transport sector will be reduced by 90% and they have set a maximum of one third to be transport by car. Emissions from the energy sector is kind of low, but as the sectors grow together, it still needs to be addressed. And to, in, in order to change that, uh, we need uh, electricity for our EVs, right? And uh, they will use a flexible management system of the energy system and use an open and independent energy protocol and digital control of the energy assets and also a city portal to give uh, access for citizens and organizations and enable sharing of energy between neighbors in energy communities. So as you can hear, digitalization will be key for the transformation as well. You will hear more about that later on from Jonas Birgesson. On this slide, you see um, demonstration and system pilots that are in the planning phase, many of them partly funded by Vinova. These initiatives gather an ecosystem of actors and a portfolio of interventions in the cities toward real world demonstration to succeed with a system change toward climate neutrality. But mobilizing for green transition is not about pilots and demos. We need to find out how we can scale such needs developments to the new normal? How can our ambition and ambitious initiatives like this be one small step for mankind and one giant leap for climate neutral cities? How can this be our mission, moonshot? So now it's time for Jonas to tell you more about Lund. Jonas Birgesson, you are the founder and chairman of Via Europa and also entrepreneur in residence Co-Action Co Energy City of Lund. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonas Bergeson, and I will be challenging you as a high capacity uh, audience because I will show a lot of slides, not the nice professional kinds that you already got, right? So there will be lots and lots of information. There will be some looking back at history to take a forward leap into the future. So here we go. And I'm just going to clock my here so, because I know that I'm going to get kicked off. But here we go. So the future, it's already here, but it's problematic. There's lots of challenges. We'll know about that. And you can tackle those in different ways. One way of tackling it is to try to go back in history. But that's not really a very good strategy as technology is the foundation for all of our civilized lives and the high quality lifestyle that we have. So, you know, nobody wants to go back when you really think about it. What I'm going to show you now is that we can do low fixed costs for all the green energy you need if we take out the biggest single problem, which is the electrical grid. The electrical grids were great, but now they're past their prime and they need to be revolutionized as the telephone grids were in, in the history. So technology is important. The downside of that is that it means that you have to work with nerds such as me. This is Swedish nerds. What Swedish nerds do is that everybody else, they translated Dungeons and Dragons to their language, right? Oh no, we did our own nerd game. And this is typical for Swedish nerds. So how do you attract nerds? 
Well, you build really large scientific uh, investments like uh, Slack. Slack and the uh, physicists that worked at Slack were the founders of Homebrew Computer Club. And you know, that kicked off the computer revolution, that gave us IP from the US, we're very grateful, the internet protocol. But Europe can also do things. This is from CERN and the frustrated system administrator getting different formats from people coming from all over the world invented the World Wide Web. Tim Berners-Lee, thank you very much. One US, one Europe, okay. What we're doing now in Lund, the nerdy town where I come from, is that we're putting up a really large scientific endeavor called the ESS, European Spallation Source. And I can talk for days about that, but I don't have the time. No hint, point taken. But this is our favorite, um, uh, <laughs> Jeremy Hastings, he's our favorite professor at Stanford because he said this great thing. Lund, because of ESS, can become for a decade the global capital of science which is really cool. It's a very, very small town, but it's a very large research university, as you can see. Berkeley is the largest research university in the US, and Lund is already at about the similar level. But it's gonna expand vastly because of the nice things that we do with the uh, ESS. So you can check the numbers to see that I'm not lying. Okay, anyway, why am I here? What credentials do I have to talk about things in the future, right? So we have to look what I've done in the past. And I have been around for 3,000 years. <laughs> and I'm famous for being the Swedish unicorn. You know, socialist Sweden, how can we create unicorns? And how did that stupid nerd guy create two of them before he was 30? No, that's not real. So this is how media portrays you if you're an entrepreneur in Sweden, right? So you have these great, uh, Former industrial entrepreneurs, Ingvar Kamprad founded IKEA. You have Hans Rausing, which is the founder of Tetra Pak. If you had a good you know, milk this morning, probably it came from a Tetra Pak carton. Uh, so we created a dot-com company. We were the third largest in the world, and we helped industrial companies. And I also got to go to you know, interesting places, meeting interesting people, like World Economic Forum, blah, blah, blah. And according to the Secret Service, I'm the first and last person to visit the White House in shorts. <laughs> It's a fact, it's a fact, you can check it. Uh, but what we did we really do? Well, what we did was that we created some global standards. Did you know that Sweden with Volvo and Frank Faber's consultants, we were actually doing a couple of cool things. We did the world's first product launch live over the internet in Paris in September 1996. Vanessa Paradis was playing the after party and we nerds were in the basement fiddling with the ISD and modems. We also built the world's first car configurator where you actually could build a car and actually buy it online, which is now standard anywhere. But just to show how early Sweden was, this is the European largest e-commerce in 1999 with IKEA. In those days, you remember, you had to put a printed ad to get people to your website. This is pre-Google, right? So when IKEA put the URL, or urlet, as my campbell called it, on the catalog, which was the largest printed version in the world, we got this. And this is in Silicon Valley at the same time that Jeff Bezos is starting Amazon, right? He just got his first investors, mom and dad, so. We were a little bit ahead uh, in those days. And we were doing it on those things. I can actually tell you which sequence of these noises make what, right? But I'm not gonna do that because of time constraints and nerd constraints. So. So we did that, you know, uh, we got a lot of experience and we got a lot of attention, blah, blah, blah. But what did we practically do? Practically, before us, the internet, the IP protocol, were constrained by bad infrastructure. They were living in their siblings' old clothing. The IP protocol was squeezed into the old telephone network and the old cable TV network. And then we, first in the world, actually built a specific new infrastructure, a new network, that took away all of these limitations that were before. So this is pretty significant. Because what happened, here you had one infrastructure for one service, right? This is very costly. What was proven when we built this new network were that you could actually do near real time things over IP protocol. This was previously not known. And then of course, the rest is history. So now all of the services became digital, there are now applications. And so our, our actions can have a global impact. This is a nerdy picture, you know, me, super nerd in the Swedish uh, official garb for the Olympic Committee athletes, right? This is an oxymoron. And we're, we're showing it when we're doing the world's first IP television distribution. 
because we had the network so we could do new, new fun things. This is pre-Netflix and everything. Okay. So the second degree of innovation, right? You create new infrastructure. You can do new things. So we got things like Skype, Spotify happening in Sweden because we had networks before. And then when everybody else got networks, they had product they could sell, right? We're not as entrepreneurial as the US, so we have to cheat. We have to have better infrastructure. But one way we did was we created the computer game industry. The modern computer game industry came out of Sweden because of the high-speed networks, because it's a real-time thing. And you say, what, what is that nerdy guy you know, talking about the computer industry? Do you know how much the computer industry had a turnover last year? Over $300 billion. It is larger than Hollywood and the music industry combined. Just, you know, and don't talk about how many hours you, you spend or I spend on that. No. Okay, so that's history. Moving forward to what's next. So we call this, the old tradition was from, the, from industrial society to the network economy, right? So now we're going from the network economy into the energy society. This is the next paradigm shift. So what's the difference between what we have today? Production is not really the problem. Production is not really the problem. And I'll, if I have more time, I'll go into details and I'll talk to everybody afterwards. So the cost, if we allow the production to be let loose and not being constrained by distribution uh, systems and local storage, we will create a much better network. Low fixed price for all the green energy you need. An abundance of energy, okay? But we also need to do it by this. This is a very terrible day, 22nd of November, the year 2022, and the Russian really not nice, aggressive, super evil people had luck, because they can't aim, but they had luck. They hit the wrong transforming station in Ukraine. 97% of the Ukrainian grid had to be turned off. Infants were dying because they couldn't get the electricity. The power stations were working, but the old system is way too sensitive for disruptions. We can't have a system like that that is critical infrastructure for the nations. We have to build it like the internet, like the American taught us with the ARPANET. You don't need to have single points of failure. Okay, so why is Europe suddenly on you know, the back foot? Isn't Europe just you know, a holiday season for Americans to go you know, after they do innovation? Because we have a crisis. 75, uh, um, 750 kilometers from uh, my home. The Ukrainians are holding the border, protecting us. So there's a crisis, there's a land war in Europe, right? And this has get a lot of governance going. So things that we never dreamt about is now happening. And the EU have done two very, very important uh, policy decisions that opens up new waste innovation that is not currently available anywhere in the world on that kind of scale. First, they put a lot of money into this. You know, so they, they launched you know, tons of public funding to partnerships and so that's, that's one thing. But <clears throat> the other thing they did is that they created something called energy communities, which means that we are now in 27 countries allowed to build parallel electrical infrastructure. We are built a parallel electrical grid, which is fantastic because now we can prove how you can do it in a much better way. Bottom up, the internetification of the energy distribution system. So now I will very quickly, in four minutes and 51 seconds, tell you how we're proving that in practical reality in the city of Lund. Okay, hang on. So this is what we're doing. We're inserting an energy router, the green box, behind the traditional meter. We don't need to change the old grid. We're building a parallel grid where you have the old grid here, the, all of your old devices, you don't need to change sockets, you have the same you know, electricity happening for your appliances. But then we have a new side. On the other side, on, the, on the, my left side, on the router, you have a DC network, direct current new network, which gives us the ability of putting an unlimited amount of solar panels, an unlimited amount of other local power generation, and local storage, and we have all the effect that we ever would need to charge all of the electrical vehicles, which is very important, as we heard before. This is in one building. But the cool thing is when you do this, when you put it all together. So in this example, you have like five, sorry, eight different buildings. And now, typically today, they are having connect, eight connections, one individual, one meter for each. 
But with this, maybe they only have one meter for all of those eight buildings. Maybe they have two meters, but then you should say to the power company, please, we would like to have an extra meter if it is connected to another transforming station so that we have redundancy. We have two ways of getting the energy in to the neighborhood system, and in this system we distribute it. Okay, so that's nice theory. So what are we doing in practical reality? As we said, we got this nice task, a large system demonstrator. So our job is to prove how we're going to become climate neutral to 2030. So this is what we're doing in this little nerdy town of Lund. So what do we need? We need basically a layered model. This is like the OC model. We need to have an open energy sharing operator. We need to have a new protocol. We want to give back to the US. So thank you for the internet protocol. Now we're creating the energy protocol, the open free language to communicate independent of vendors so that it becomes as easy to share energy with your neighbors as it is today to share Wi-Fi. Okay, then we're building these energy routers. This is like the Cisco thing did for the internet. Now we're doing that on, on energy. And then of course we need to have storage and new cables. So very quickly going through these, these are the different layers. What we create is like an app store for energy services on top of infrastructure. So the people owning the infrastructure do not have to create all the services, right? This is the beauty of the app store, right? And we've done this uh, since in 1999, Via Europa did this first in the world for internet services. So if you're connected in Hammarby Sjöstad in Stockholm, this was the first place that they put it, you're connected to with your fiber. It's not only Verizon services or Comcast services. You're connected and then you have a neutral marketplace. So you can pick and choose with a click of a button, three seconds later, you have changed your ISP. This has led to that Europe, in Europe, oh, sorry, in all of OECD actually, Sweden have the lowest cost per megabit in all of OECD because of a built-in competition, because of clear layers instead of vertical integration. So now we're doing the same thing for energy services. And what you want to have is that you can invest in your local batteries, your local resources, and now on the marketplace you can see what type of energy resource do I want to share with marketplaces or my neighbors. And you can change with one click, three seconds, who is going to have access to your equipment. Same thing with EV charging, of course. And then you get this kind of structure. You try to get the energy um, that you need resolved as locally as possible. If you can have it from the roof in real time, take that. If you can't have that, take it from your storage. If you can't take it from your storage, take it from a real time source in your local energy grid. If you can't do that, let's talk to other energy uh, grids, and then in the way we can find a way. And what we need to do that is so we need to be able to routing, and the routing means that we can send it to where uh, the energy is needed, automatically bottom up without any central points. The internetification of the distribution system. To do that, we need boxes. These boxes enables us to have all of these nice storages, and then of course we can route, this is for the nerdy people, we can route energy, which is really cool, but we don't have time to talk about that. So what we're doing now in Lund, is in this great little place, is that we have done some great innovations before, like the modern broadband, the modern uh, telephony, Bluetooth, and you know even charging, roads that charge vehicles as they go. Three pilots, and I'm very out of time, but I'm just gonna do 30 seconds on this. So this is the first alpha site, we're co connecting different buildings. This is the beta site, and this is the gamma site. So three sites, you're welcome to come and visit in Lund, and once we prove it here, we hope to spread it through these kind of partnerships around the world. Thank you for letting me have at least a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. That was very impressive. Um, I mean, Silicon Valley has nothing on, on Sweden. Uh, that's the feel I got from this. Uh, maybe I should go back. Uh, but let's uh, move on. We will now have a discussion on stage between Ole Dirks, who is the head of large-scale investments at Viable Cities, together with Priscilla Negreiro's Lead City Climate Finance Alliance, to initiate a conversation about what is needed to scale transformative efforts in cities. So, Ole, what is needed? Thank you.
And she also leads this uh, Cities Climate Finance Leadership Alliance that Marcus was talking about. And this is a platform for cooperation, partnerships, advocacy in the subnational climate finance. And they work to ensure that finance will be deployed at scale for city level climate action by 2030. So CCFLA established a bridge between demand and supply for a city level climate related finance with cities, natural governments, and private sectors. And listening to Jonas now, uh, so Jonas and Lund, they're part of the portfolio of system demonstrators that Viable Cities and partners uh, have, including uh, or, or their collaboration with Vinova uh, in Lund. So we really want to support these type of really promising initiatives to scale. But we need to sort of understand what is needed. Uh, and I couldn't think of a better person than Priscilla to sort of talk us through it a bit. So I'm happy that we have quite a lot of time to sort of discuss it with, uh, with her, but bear with me because the technology is a bit messy here. So let's see. Priscilla, to begin with, can you hear us? Yes, perfectly. Hi, Wonderful. everyone. Wonderful. So, so welcome to San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> I know the room here, but there's a wonderful group of people uh, representing many different sectors from the Nordics, from also, of course, here in the San Francisco. So I'd, I'd like to sort of uh, hear you a bit uh, on some of the issues that have been highlighted during the conversation so far. But uh, to begin with, uh, is there enough money uh, available for climate investments in cities? Uh, so hi everyone, I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, well, in the end of my day in London, not in San Francisco as I wish to. And I think um, if there is a short answer, so is there enough funding uh, for climate investments in general, the short answer would be no, <laughs> there isn't. So it's it doesn't it doesn't mean that the money is not there it means that it's not necessarily being uh, led to climate investments. And maybe just let me give you some numbers so you know what I'm talking about. So climate policy initiatives, so these institutions where I work, we have been tracking global flows of urban, uh, of, sorry, of, uh, of climate finance generally, also urban, um, throughout these years. And in 2021, we have uh, the global climate finance flows reached almost 1.3 trillion US dollars per year in average. So we are actually investing more into climate investment. It was a big jump from our last global landscape. Uh, however, if we want to tackle the adverse impacts of climate change, we should be talking more around nine to $10 trillion annually from today till 2030. So uh, the big question is, there is money flowing if we take uh, for example, how much is invested? Uh, so just on the fossil fuel subsidized in 2022, we had more than 7 trillion USD dollars that were invested only that year. So there is money out there, but not necessarily going on, on the scale as you as we have been discussing this morning here, right? And on the size that we want to for this to happen. So, right, but we are doing a lot of work with you to try to change it, right? So, so, so thank you so much. So this is also you talking in relation to many of the financial institutions. Uh, some of them are also here in the U.S., but also from a lot of, like a city level or local government level perspective, uh, there is like progress made with uh, the climate investment plans. Uh, this is one of the things that we're working on in Sweden together with the 20, 23 cities as part of our program in Viber Cities. But what would they actually need to do uh, in order to make a really strong climate investment plan. And just to give you uh, some perspective on this, when Stockholm, which was one of the first uh, cities in Sweden, where they launched uh, their uh, climate investment plan uh, just by the end of the year, uh, last year, uh, they said that this is their first and their worst uh, climate investment plan for the city of Stockholm. And it's in something in that, uh, which is a perspective that we want to learn, learn together with the cities on what is really needed and what they need to take into account. And still, it's a quite big number that the city has in, uh, in the climate investment plan. It's actually over $15 billion uh, for this uh, investment plan for Stockholm. And now we want to inspire yet others to do such plans. Uh, so what would your message be for cities like Stockholm and, and others that really are progressing in this field, what they need to take into account? So I think, I think my first point on the capital investment plans is that this is, it's key. 
because I think for for many years um, we have been having internationally for developed countries and developing countries more and more support for cities to put out climate action planning so they know where they wanted to invest and prioritize. What, what has been is like we haven't been transforming this climate action planning into capital investment investment planning. And I think this is a key area that uh, needs, we need to do that jump if we want to really to scale. Uh, this has been a request. We published last year a report analyzing the role of multilateral development banks as, as an example. And we have interviewed most of the MDBs worldwide, including uh, the European Investment Bank uh, that works in Europe and in BRD. And one of the key points that was highlighted is cities, they they are more and more being able to, to work on their planning, but not necessarily these plans help us to transform into actual investment. So the financial planning is key. It also means that, um, and then answering your question, what do we need to do to make them more effective? First, um, and I think that has been happening throughout Europe, particularly in the 100 net zero cities program, is integrate financial planning with national targets, right? Like when we were talking about climate, so NDCs, NAPs, LATs. And this is important because it brings like, how can you internationally and nationally discuss priorities from the country and where the money should be flowing at and then how this relates into the local level. Another thing is identify city needs, of course, to translate high level climate policy into concrete measures to attract financing. Uh, one key aspect that we we have been working with a lot of different uh, players in the urban climate finance space is while developing the project itself, identifying and mobilizing potential funders from the beginning of this process. What happens um, often is while developing not only the, the investment plan itself, but the project that goes within it, uh, we structure it in a way, and then afterwards we go to the investor and say, here it is. And then we go have to go back a couple of steps because like the criteria and the demand uh, can also be specific. So how can you try to mobilize this investment of partners since the beginning? Um, and I would say like maybe a last one because there's so much to say on that topic will be how to prepare projects that are, and I think this word is now more and more unused, but like, bankable, or at least you're thinking and integrating with this financial plan and uh, projects that can be rentable with others that potentially not, but like could be a possibility of uh, aggregating it. So thinking about the investment plan in a broader sense, in a more programmatic way, rather than project by project. And I think this is quite key, particularly in the city space where a lot of the uh, the sizes of the project might be not so attractive for um, private because of the, the yeah because of of the size of the project itself. So I, I think I think that's in really interesting also in relation to the city of uh, Stockholm, Priscilla. Uh, so what they what they're proposing uh, is also that the the private sector and sort of the not the local government at, at least uh, would stand for say eighty percent of the investment needed uh, for for the transition. Uh, so this also really means that they ha need to have a portfolio approach uh, for the investments in the city. So that's a quite hard work to do. So to sort of gather all the stakeholders needed, including uh, property developers and others, and sort of get them in the right uh, direction toward climate neutrality. But I, I'd like to sort of uh, get back to your organization as well because I, I think it's quite um, exciting uh, because you have have many members within the city's climate finance leadership alliance uh, could you tell us a bit more about them and how they represent different funding streams that would be of value for cities and sort of the many stakeholders in the cities yes sure so for those that don't know ccfla so we are a multi-level and multi-stakeholder coalition aimed at like closing the gap let's say on the urban climate finance space we're very focused on working with uh, different types of organization. That's why we say uh, multi-level, but all of them, what they have in common is that they are or implementing projects directly with city or financing on funding or doing research, um, trying to tackle and try to solve a bit of the big challenges that we have on the urban climate finance space. So we have members from city networks. We don't have cities as members because the idea is to work with, let's say, the organizations that are implementing projects with within cities. So like, how can we coordinate and help to 
um, faster cooperation among um, the different players there are in the space. And we know there are many, right? So we have city networks that are working directly with city, global ones, and a couple of like local ones. We have public and private financial institutions. And we're, um, so on the public side, multilateral development banks, um, and on the private side, asset managers and, and others. And then we have what uh, we call the enablers, so organizations that are uh, or doing research or implementing projects with cities. And I think I just want to so, highlight sorry, Prashad, one you, player that sorry. I think might be yeah, that, that uh, was particularly my... important, which is project preparation facilities. And we have a couple of them working within uh, CCFLA. So organizations giving technical assistance to cities uh, that can uh, to develop projects and potentially this portfolio that you mentioned, Oli. Um, and this is very, very much important. So we work a lot to try to coordinate this TA, so this technical assistant, and these institutions that are implementing support, so they are more effective, and the projects are able to, let's say, like walk through the value chain of, of could, urban could climate you, investment. Could you give an example? Because now we have the sort of the the, the breadth uh, of the different uh, institutions or organizations that are part as as members. But give you just name a few of them uh, that that some of the people in the audience would would recognize. Oh sure. Uh, so in terms of works, we have C forty, ECLE, UCLG. Uh, from public uh, uh, institutions, so the World Bank, we have the European Investment Bank, uh, also in our uh, steering committee, EBRD, the um, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and then there are set asset managers such as Meridium, and then a lot of different UN institutions that do work directly with city. UN Habitat is the most obvious one, but you have the UNCDF, uh, and then foundations, Bloomberg Philanthropies, um, Active WRI. So we have now, if I, I, I we have now 87 uh, different members. There's a lot of people not naming all, all, but just to show you how it is, it is interesting how we have increased a lot of our membership over the last couple of years. And it means that you have even institutions that are not focused on urban climate finance, but they are interested in working in this space. So I think it's a good good news that we are increasing the awareness on the role of cities on at COP uh, last COP 28. This was very clear. There was a massive participation of mayors, maybe even some uh, people that are in this room today, coming to COP uh, to actually put the city and the city's finance agenda. In. And I think it's it's quite interesting how this and and useful, right? Like that this topic is taking traction. But but now since you have these large number of members and you also gave some positive news in the beginning uh, of, of, uh, of this session, uh, but is your feeling that um, there is a potential for aggregate finance support uh, from many of these members like jointly for the different funding streams that would be needed for uh, examples such as the, the energy transition? Yeah, this is this is a great uh, point actually, and uh, and I think it it links with what we just discussed about the um, the the climate financial um, plans, right? From the cities, one key point and one key challenge that many cities face, and this would include um, cities such as Oslo, but it would could potentially be even for cities as Cape Town or as Nairobi. It, it doesn't matter. It, not necessarily the the projects that will be developed within the cities are large enough in terms of ticket size, let's say, to be able to get um, potential financiers from public or private institutions. And this is because, so this is one reason on why aggregating and thinking of a more programmatic approach when we are thinking about urban climate finance. So as you said, only more of a portfolio approach is so important. So in aggregating finance, I, I will answer your question is, is there a movement within like this broad group of organizations to be able to do so? I think there is a, an interest, but it's a very hard to do because you would need to, if you want to aggregate projects, for example, you would need to do under like a, let's say, a national government because you have to have the right enabling environment to be able to do it. You have to have the interest from cities and then you add potentially a layer of coordination that is very hard to do. 
but we need to do it <laughs> because if we don't, if we don't think more aggregated when we're talking about the, the transition and on, particularly on cities, it's going to be very hard for us to do it. So we have to work more and we have very examples uh, around the globe on how it has been done through like, and, and by examples, I mean by aggregating. So aggregating procurement for cities, uh, Argentinian cities have been doing that uh, with a joint fund that was created with support of um, different players, including uh, foundations. And then they actually use the fund to do uh, bulk procurement and it helps and it can serve more than 100 different cities in Argentina. You have a very famous example in India about uh, cities that went together like they uh, to actually buy electrical buses, also on the, the procurement side. There are examples on poll insurance mechanisms where cities were um, in Philippines. So there are examples here and there on how you can better aggregate projects to work on a more and project cities and, and even structures. Uh, but we have a, a, a lot of work to do to try to uh, streamline those, right? Like uh, make them easier to structure. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Um, so I, I think it's uh, like promising trends that uh, you see uh, aggregated uh, purchasing power uh, in on a city level and perhaps also uh, aggregated finance on a more uh, national or subnational level and perhaps uh, global. Um, but uh, there is also this thing that when you uh, invest in what would be the climate and neutral city's future and the potential, uh, there are some things that are quite clear on what the type of investment would be needed. And sometimes it's quite tricky. Uh, so we heard from uh, Andreas from Vinova earlier today talking about system innovation and everything that is needed to take into account and that technology is not only the right on, the, the only thing is a lot of other things to take into account. Um, so on, on that, uh, it's also while reaching the climate neutrality uh, objectives that we have, uh, we want to do it in a way where it's a good life for all in, within planetary boundaries or the quality of life. Uh, so this is sometimes quite messy and hard to measure and all, all that. So uh, is a good life, is, is that a bankable asset? Uh, would you say you mentioned bankable products before? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting uh, question, and and I think and I know that the session is also about a uh, good life, right? Like, and now I I had the the role uh, of talking about finance. So, from a strict financial point of view, good life is not uh, a bankable asset uh, in the traditional sense, let's say. But uh, like for those that know that the don't know much about the financial jargon, so a, a bankable asset would refer normally to financial assets that can be readily converted to cash. So like we're talking more about loans, credit, real estate, stocks, etc. Yet good life and like a, a better uh, structure in life and, uh, can have a huge impact on one's financial well-being and including the city's financial well-being. For instance, if you think of like uh, the impacts of like an investing in systems or in and good physical, let's let's be even even broader in good physical and mental health. A less polluted city can reduce medical medical expenses, increase productivity, potentially even increase the amount of taxes and revenues that the city can put together. And this will advance, let's say, their capability of getting access to to markets. And this can be this example can be reproduced in so many different areas that. Like in the end, if I answer after all of that, uh, good life, it can be, yes, of course, can be a bankable asset in beyond the very strict financial uh, point of view. And this is and this is key. Right. Like and I think the examples we heard be before and how so many cities are doing, trying to find solutions, technologies. I found it the nerdy example from Lude. <laughs> uh, it's it's this kind of activity that will improve the, not only the city well-being, but also how they can get access to, to more fun for the climate transition. So thank you so much, Priscilla. So just to round off now, so again, this is like a, you know, many of the Nordic countries uh, are represented here in, uh, in the room and also part of the Bifrost uh, event. So uh, what would your message be uh, to uh, the Nordics and also in collaboration with US stakeholders that also have like a global outreach what should we focus on now uh, when sort of moving ahead the rest of the year? So uh, I think there is one focus, the, the internal focus, and it's a, it's a hard place for me to be, uh, uh, <laughs> giving this 
this advice uh, to Nordic and, and US uh, countries. I think we need to focus on the scale, if I could think through, right? Like uh, now uh, we have been throughout this last year trying to figure it out, like uh, the technology that we need to implement to make the transition. But we need to figure it out how to do it in the scale we need and in the pace we need. Like we know that we don't have a lot of time uh, the decade, like we have six years to end this uh, decade and it, maybe it's not enough. And we are talking about scale. What does it mean, right? Like, so how can we aggregate projects? So summarizing a bit of the things we say, like uh, build concrete and uh, financial plans where we put all of the all of the players and stakeholders on the same table and we're able to tackle many challenges at the same time. It, it's very hard. I know I'm being very broad on my answer, but I think there is another thing and another responsibility so, so from Priscilla, I countries. I, I really want to hear the continuation of it, uh, but we're <laughs> running out of time a bit. So oh, yes, yes, yes. it's obviously a lot more to, to discuss uh, on what is needed to scale. So taking really niche developments that are happening here in Sweden, in McKinney Sabagabo, in Bogota, in Bristol. But we want to discuss this across the Nordics, and we want to discuss this with you, Priscilla, and your brilliant colleagues. Uh, and we also want to find out who are the sort of the relevant stakeholders here in California and other parts of, of the US uh, to sort of join us uh, with the Nordics and to sort of figure out how we can really scale niche developments and how to, we can take that into climate neutral cities, not only Sweden, not only Europe, not only the US, but globally. Thank you. Thank you.